if you're the type of person that likes to do a lot of research, understand everything about a product or service before you buy it, then this video is for you. I'm going to go over uh, in depth all the different things you need to think of if you're buying your, a home for the first time. And I'm going to go everything from do everything from credit scores uh, to budgeting um, to types of mortgages. And if you stay to the end, I'm also going to talk about how to really kind of build a real estate empire by starting on the right foot. So we'll get started with credit scores. Everybody knows you have to good credit, have to have a good credit score, I would assume. Um, again, if you're the type of person that does a lot of research, you may follow Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey is fantastic. Um, you know, he's got a loyal uh, following and his real message is about debt and how to get out of debt. Um, I tend to not agree with one thing he sort of harps on. You do have to have credit, which means you do have to have a little bit of debt to have a credit score. Um, so if you're the type of person that's paid cash for everything or, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you don't even have a credit score, you need to go ahead and get a credit score, which would be to maybe get something called a secured credit card. A secured credit card is where you give the credit company a, you know, two or three hundred dollars. They open up a credit card for you with that balance, and then they start reporting to the credit bureaus. It takes about six months to even generate a credit score. So you need to do that right away. Um, the other thing is there are different types of credit. So if you go to buy a car, they're going to have a different credit algorithm. Uh, if you get a credit card, they're going to have a different algorithm and a mortgage is also going to have a different algorithm. Um, so what that means is even though you might look on a service like credit karma, or you might look on your bank might give you your credit score. That's probably going to be a higher score that we would pull for a mortgage. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, in general, if you have a 740 or above credit score, things don't really don't get any better as far as uh, rates or anything like that. Um, on the other hand, if you have below a 700, then that's when we might be looking at different kinds of mortgages, um, et cetera. So the message, get a credit score, make your payments on time <clears throat> and you'll be OK. Uh, the other thing we need to talk about, which has to do with credit, is budgeting for a home. So although you might qualify for a certain mortgage amount, in other words, we look at all your numbers and we say you could afford this payment, you might not be comfortable with that payment or say in the real world, you can't afford that payment, even though um, it sh we show that you can on paper. And the reason is when we calculate uh, how much you can afford for a mortgage, we're looking at what shows up on your credit report primarily. So for instance, we only look at the minimum payment due on your credit card. Um, you know, <clears throat> if you have a $5,000 balance, but you only have a $25 minimum payment, then we only require $25. But you know that you'll have to make bigger payments on that to pay it off one day. Um, other things you need to look at are like student loans, which I need to do a, a whole video on that. But in general, even though you don't maybe make any payments on your student loans, um, maybe you're in deferment, that doesn't mean that we don't have to charge you for it or uh, calculate a minimum payment uh, for your ratios or qualifying. Um, in general, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that it's going to be half a percent of whatever your total balance is. So if you have $50,000 or $100,000 in student loans, you know, that could be a big number and it might eat into your um, you know, qualification, how much mortgage you can qualify for. Um, other things you need to look at, of course, are things like, well, if you have uh, child support or your divorce and you have alimony, you know, even though this isn't on your credit report, you're still going to have to um, qualify with those numbers in your ratio. Uh, and when I talk about ratio, I'm talking about the debt to income ratio. So I can go ahead and talk about that for a minute. Um, in general, we would always take your before tax income and 
your total debt, in other words, all of the payments that show up on your credit report, the other things I mentioned, student loans, et cetera, plus your mortgage payment can't be over about 45% of your monthly before tax income. Um, and, you know, obviously in a case like now, yeah, this is 2024, mortgage rates are a little high. You know, that's a problem sometimes, but, uh, but that's, that's how we, we, uh, figure that out. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing I might want to talk about is just the mortgage process in general. Um, I actually have a book. If you happen to be in North Carolina, it really qual uh, qual uh, works in any state. Is for first time home buyers. If you have any interest in that, put a, uh, your, uh, put a comment in uh, the comment section or you can get on my website. Happy to send you a copy. Um, <clears throat> but the first thing to do, of course, is what you're doing now, which is research mortgages and talk to a, a loan officer or a mortgage broker like myself. The reason is, even though people tend to call a real estate agent first, because they're excited about looking for a house, which makes sense. The first thing a good real estate agent is going to say is, are you pre-approved? And then they're going to send you to whoever they trust as, you know, their loan officer of choice. Um, so you need to reach out. You don't have to call the real estate agent first. Uh, you know, I have plenty of clients that call me directly and I can help you too. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take your application the application only comes to the loan officer so they can work on it. They're going to pull your credit. Um, they're going to look at your income, probably request some paycheck stubs. Um, if you're self-employed, that's huge uh, because I have other videos on that. Let's just say it's not a straightforward calculation. You definitely want to be pre-approved before you even think about buying a house if you're self-employed. Um, so once the loan officer or I, you know, figure out how much you can qualify for, then um, we would send you a pre-approval letter, let your agent know what you qualify for, and you go out and look for a house. Um, you know, then you're sort of in the hands of the agent and you need to make sure you pick a good agent. Again, that's another video I can do. A good agent is somebody who's done a lot of transactions. It's just like you wouldn't want to take your car to be fixed by a mechanic who just got out of mechanic school. Um, you know, you or, or a doctor, you know, you don't want them practicing on you. So somebody, preferably not your aunt's sister, because she has a real estate license, a bad realtor can really screw you up. Um, but anyway, you're going to look for a house. Typically, the agent will call me or text me and say, hey, we're going to put an offer on this house for this much. Then I'll generate a pre-approval letter for that much and send it off. Um, because you don't necessarily want to tell the other side uh, or the seller, you know, you qualify for $800,000 house when you only want to buy a $500,000 house. Um, and then once you get under contract, um, you're going to, you know, write an earnest money check and that earnest money check will be a credit towards a down payment on your house. Um, then when the mortgage comes in to us or the contract comes into us, I'm sorry, we are going to you know, lock your interest rate according to your credit score, what the rates are doing that day. Um, then you'll get a set of disclosures. One of the disclosures allows us to order the appraisal, which we we'll want to do as soon as possible. Um, and then while the appraisal is being done, all of the documents that you provide for the mortgage are submitted to somebody called an underwriter. They figure out what uh, whether you're qualified or not, you've been pre-approved, so you'll be qualified, but then there'll be certain conditions. There's always conditions. It might be, you know, explain this large deposit in your bank account or what have you. Um, you'll typically be pre-approved or be approved with the conditions before the appraisal comes back. Then when the appraisal comes back, um, it, you know, it's signed off on reviewed by the underwriter and uh, eventually the loan will go to closing and you'll wire your money to the closing attorney or the uh, escrow uh, title company um, and close on your loan. 
So that's super high uh, level overview. But, you know, the next thing we need to talk about is down payments. Um, so as a first time home buyer, uh, if you get a conventional mortgage, then you can put as little as 3% down. An FHA mortgage, you can put 3.5% down and you don't have to be a first time home buyer. Um, if you're a veteran, you can use your veterans benefits and have 100% financing, put no money down. And then if you sort of want to live out in the country, then you could get a USDA loan and again, put zero money down. Um, there's also uh, down payment assistance programs. So it depends on what state you're in. Um, as a broker, we have access to a lot of different programs. In general, if you have money for a down payment, it's always better to put that down. If you have 3% to put down, it's going to be better. The reason is your interest rate is going to be better. If you get down payment assistance, typically that money has to be paid back. If you sell the house within a certain time frame, which is anywhere from five to 15 years. Um, and the down payment can come as a gift from a family member. Um, you could borrow it from your 401k or take it from your 401k if you need to. So there's different strategies, but even though there are down payment assistance programs, I would always say, if you have the money, put it down. On the other side of that, if you have good credit, let's say you have a 720 or a 740 plus credit score, then you would get a conventional loan and mortgage insurance, which has a really negative connotation. It's got a bad name. If you have good credit, it's really not bad at all. It's very, very inexpensive. And if you get an FHA loan, which would be for sort of a lower credit score, the mortgage insurance rate is the same, whether you have a 500 credit score or an 800 credit score. So, um, and also mortgage rate or mortgage insurance rates on FHA loans have come down in the last year or so. So sometimes it makes more sense. Um, but, uh, but in general, that's sort of one of the only benefits of being a first time home buyer, I think is a conventional loan, the ability to put 3% down. Now, if you live in a certain area, and you make under a certain amount, then you may get a break on the interest rate. You may get a break on the mortgage insurance, but that's typically going to be for lower uh, to, to lower middle income borrowers. But if you're in that category, make sure and ask about it because, um, you know, one of the programs for Fannie Mae loan, which is just sort of a vanilla 30 year fixed loan is called a home ready program through Fannie Mae. Um, and then Freddie Mac has a version of, of that as well. Um, you know, I've gone over a lot of stuff. This video is getting kind of long, <laughs> but uh, one thing I did want to cover is sort of long-term financial planning. There's a lot of talk about house hacking. That's a really popular word, but that can be very powerful. So home ownership in America is really fueled wealth. It's probably the best um, investment you can make because you're able to leverage, um, you know, a large asset, you know, say a five hundred thousand dollar house, and only put three percent down. So that home is going to appreciate every year. It's going to be worth more and more, and your mortgage balance, of course, will go down a little bit. Now, the interesting thing is, as long as you live in the house for a year, you could rent that house and buy another house and you could use the rent 75% of the rent um, for the house you're leaving to qualify for the next house. So now you own two houses. Somebody's paying for one house. It's appreciating. And now you own another house. Now you put 5% down maybe on the next house, but this is how people build massive wealth in America. And you could build a massive real estate portfolio um, in a very short amount of time. So I wanted to mention that because this video seems to be for people that want to do a lot of research, do a lot of planning, and this is the ultimate plan. So if you found this video helpful, I would appreciate it if you'd click like and subscribe. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below, or you can reach out on my website mortgagesbyscott.com. Thanks for watching.